Part 1. Spring. Asterisk. Every year, shortly after the beginning of spring, he made his first visit to the town where he was born and where Don Mario Penalver had beautiful farms and extensive farmland, who was held up by numerous occupations in the capital of Spain, which he abandoned only to collect the rents that his settlers owed him every three months, introduce some improvements in his possessions and rest, even if it was for a short time, from the hectic life of Madrid. He had a nephew of his as administrator, an honest and simple man who, born and raised in the countryside, could and knew how to take care of those vast lands with more success than his own owner, supported by numerous laborers. He was married and the father of two precious children, both godchildren of Don Mario and who bore the names of Mercedes and Raphael in memory of his ancestors. They lived in a pretty country house surrounded by a large garden and the old uncle used to stop there when he stopped in town, occupying its main rooms. It was always a day of celebration for the family when the beloved godfather of the children arrived, and in that season nature joined them to celebrate him. The lilac streets were full of aromatic flowers, the almond trees were also in bloom, the other trees showing off their emerald leaves and the acacias showing off their white clusters. Roses of various kinds and different shades perfumed the atmosphere, birds sang, butterflies fluttered and insects buzzed. The sun was illuminating the scene with its golden rays, the sky was blue and clear, and a soft breeze swayed the plants on their stems. A carriage pulled by mules stopped at the gate of the possession and Don Mario got out, his nephew, whom his nephew had gone to wait for at the station a little far away. His wife affectionately embraced the old man who covered the rosy cheeks of his two godchildren with kisses. The joy was somewhat disturbed to learn that the godfather would not remain there more than three or four days. They wanted him to enter the house but the newcomer, who was strong and agile despite his years, wanted to walk a little through their lands enjoying that delicious spring morning. He took the girl Sleft with his right hand and Raphael with the other. What have you been doing around here since I haven't seen you? He asked them affectionately. Godfather, answered Mercedes, we have learned our lessons well to please you, and since the good weather has arrived we walk a lot and each one of us takes care of a small part of the garden. You'll see them and I think you'll be happy. Besides, added the boy, we have many silkworms that we feed with mulberry leaves. Some butterflies are already beginning to come out of them, which are very pretty, but which die as soon as they are born. It doesn't matter, answered Don Mario they leave germs of life for many worms. This is a distraction that pleases me and that you should not abandon. Butterflies are fleeting like illusions, the reality is in the work of those who manufacture the silk, those little worms that you take care of and that produce so much. Other years you have caught caterpillars and I remember that beautiful butterflies have emerged from their chrysalises that you have released instantly in the garden granting them one of the most beautiful goods in the world. Freedom. Look, Godfather, Mercedes suddenly exclaimed, this is my garden. It is very beautiful, replied the old man, and it is taken care of with great care. And this is mine, Raphael said shortly after. I like it too, Don Mario proffered, but observe one thing, that little tree grows crooked and it would still be time to straighten it. And what else gives? The boy asked. What, what else? The godfather repeated, listen to a fable so that you know and take out from her a useful teaching. An idle peasant never gave his children a profitable example of industriousness, because he expected it all the time. He laughed a thousand times at an honest neighbor he had, seeing. Without complacency that that man spent his life observing if the tree he planted upright did not stand tall, and as soon as it twisted, disgusted, he lavished all his care on it, not remaining calm and satisfied. 
until you see it straight. The children of the idle peasant, who also made fun of the neighbor, did their whims and lived. Without sorrow or fear, because they did not know. The influence of filial affection and obedience. Lacking those cares that every good father has for. His children, they found no more pleasure from there. Childhood than deceit, looting and vagrancy. The father, showing off severely, wanted to amend the mistakes, but it was too late. The children listened to him distracted without being sorry for their guilt, and the old man did not find in his last age anyone who gave him his love and protection. While the neighbor, rich, honorable, and saw everyone respected. Never the crooked tree. It will not give tasty fruit nor good logs, while the inadvertent owner does not know how to straighten it. As a child, children are like trees, if they take bad inclinations, if they go crooked, the duty of parents and teachers is to put them straight, that childish souls and small trees are corrected at first, but then there is no human force that can amend them. Do you understand me, Raphael? Yes, Godfather, answered the boy, and I promise you that when you return you will not find any crooked tree in my garden. After the walk they went into the house and there Don Mario examined the two children of all they had learned, seeing with satisfaction that they were quite advanced in their studies. They kept his blueprints for him to see, read aloud, and answered his catechism, grammar, arithmetic, and geography questions. Until then they had had no teachers other than their parents because at their tender age they had not needed to devote themselves to deeper studies. Her mother also taught Mercedes how to do exquisite work and there were already innumerable handkerchiefs that the girl had sewn and embroidered for her godfather, who welcomed them and rewarded them with splendid gifts that he also brought for Raphael, without this having any influence. Least in the minds of those creatures who loved the old man with as much tenderness as disinterest. The rest of the day was spent between the pleasant and instructive conversation, the happy meals, the nap and another walk, and they went to bed at ten at night sleeping joyfully and peacefully. The next morning they got up early doing more or less the same life. The children took their uncle to see many nests that the swallows and other birds had made under the eaves of the roofs of the house they inhabited and in more distant buildings that were on the property, some of them occupied by the settlers, the dairy, the chicken coop, the dovecot and the large stables and garages on which was the immense attic in which the grain was locked up. The little birds fluttered around the nests they made and which were respected by all the inhabitants of the farm. Until then no one had done them the slightest harm. The swallows, away from there for many months, had returned shortly before from the warm country to which they had emigrated in order to spend the rigors of the cold there, to look for their old nests and deposit their eggs there. The nice little birds did not miss any spring. As the godfather recalled that on other occasions he had observed that nothing pleased Mercedes and Raphael as much as stories, when there in Madrid, in the solitude of his house, he prepared the trip to his beloved town. He tried to record in his imagination those stories that he learned in his childhood or those facts that he heard later and that could serve as a useful lesson for the children to tell them after their siesta and that were appropriate to the season in which they found themselves so that they could better understand them. In the three afternoons that he stayed in his country house, Mercedes and Raphael, as soon as they found out that Uncle Mario had gotten up from his nap, would wait for him in the small living room on the ground floor, which had two windows that overlooked the garden at the who climbed rose bushes and bluebells and their breathing in the aroma of the flowers, and enraptured. With the chirping of the birds, they amused themselves shortly after pleasantly hearing from the lips of the old man the following stories that he told them one each day until they began their journey back to the court and that the two children listened to with deep attention, without blinking, only sorry that time passed so quickly and deprived them of learning more stories told by their good godfather. 
Chapter 1 April, Daniel S. Field That day, April 24th of the year of grace 1896, Mr. Pedro de Zuniga returned to his town in Old Castilla after many years of absence, accompanied by his wife, his son, and his daughter. The last time he was there he was almost a child and he barely remembered the beautiful manor house, the extensive lands that were cultivated for him and the vineyards that produced excellent wine. Pedro Zuniga was very good, very intelligent, and he had found in the woman he chose for his wife a companion worthy of sharing his fate. As for the children, they were models of perfection. As soon as the gentleman had arrived, he received a note from the mayor asking him to attend the ceremony to bless the fields the next day. In consideration of his high lineage and that of being the first taxpayer, the representative of the authority did not dare to add that he would have to pay a fine if he failed. This requirement was never forgotten, so the people flocked to the sacred festival. Don Pedro left in the afternoon of the 24th to tour the place in the company of his administrator. He learned from him that the blessing was done in three days, leaving the priests in different places. They only left the west side although there was a lot of field there. The man wanted to see it and when he got there he admired how extensive it was and how well located it was, but what surprised him the most was that there was nothing planted, not even the land was tilled. On a stone he saw a boy of about twelve years old sitting in a sad and pensive attitude, and he approached him. Seeing him, the boy got up, saluting with humility and respect. Whose field is this? He asked. This, which they call Daniel's field, replied the boy, belongs to a servant of yours, and how do you have it like this, without producing anything? Because the mayor doesn't want anything else to be done. Let's see, explain that to me, Mr. de Zuniga continued. Sit here with me and talk of course, without missing the truth. My father, the boy began, was a very good man and very Christian, but the mayor decided to say that he was a Jew because his name was Daniel, and everyone believed him. Nobody gave him work, nobody bought the produce from his land, and one day he died more of grief than illness. I no longer had a mother and I was left alone, since the only relative I have left, who is a blood uncle, is so poor that in four years he has not been able to raise the money to come here with me or to take me with him. What do you do for a living? The gentleman asked with interest. The nuns of the convent of La Trinidad give me food as a reward for small services that I do for them, and the mayor pays me a daily reel for the rent of the lands that adjoin their own. The rest, since I don't know how to work them, they don't bless me or produce anything for me. The mayor has offered me that he'll buy them for me when a molder because he doesn't want to get into trouble acquiring property from miners. But, meanwhile, you live badly, right? Don Pedro interrupted. Yes sir, very bad. The gentleman turned to the administrator, who was standing a short distance away, and asked, who is the mayor? The chief of the town, replied the questioned, a bad and ambitious man who wants to keep these lands for nothing that are worth and convenient for him because they are next to his. And why are these fields not blessed? The mayor is the one who arranges where the priests have to go, they do no more than what he commands. The parish priest has been here recently and the lieutenants do not intervene in anything except in things inside the church. Zuniga got up, gave the boy a silver coin, who blushed when he received it without daring to refuse it, and after saying goodbye to him, he continued on his way accompanied by the administrator. As soon as the boy, whose name was Daniel like his father, was alone, he headed towards a somewhat distant hut where an old woman even poorer and more helpless than him lived, who always received him with affection. Senora Dorotea, he told her, I come to know if you have already collected the money for the handkerchief that you wanted to buy. No, 
Son, answered the old woman, I only collect pennies when I go to ask for door to door on Saturdays, and with that there is nothing more than bad eating. Well, here I bring you this silver coin for your piggy bank. He has given me a gentleman and I have saved it for you. God reward your good heart and give you fortune on earth and now and then glory in heaven. Tomorrow it'll be the scarf to go with it on my head to the blessing of the fields and to church afterwards. Very early the next day almost all the men of the town could be seen, old men, young men and children, well dressed, clean, with a joyous countenance, gathered in the square, waiting for the three priests, already clothed, to come out of the church. Some of them and not a few women had entered the temple. In it was also Don Pedro de Zuniga with his administrator and the main workers of his fields. And there was the chief of the town, the irreplaceable mayor, because there was no one who dared to deprive him of that position. The sacristan wore the sleeve of the parish, other men took out the banners of the brotherhoods of the daughters of Maria, Santiago, and San Sebastian and several young men, on modest litters, the Christ called del Amparo and a beautiful image of the Virgin of the Mercedes. Behind were the priests, the mayor, who offered Don Pedro the preferential seat, the main characters of the town, the farmers, the day laborers and finally some women and not a small number of children of both sexes. Arrived at a small hill, the parish priest blessed the fields while all those present at the sacred ceremony remained motionless and with the greatest recollection. This scene was repeated over the next two days, the procession going to different places, everywhere except Daniel's field, and this child was never absent, next to old Dorotea who covered her sparse hair with a colorful handkerchief bought for the party. And that excited the curiosity of all the comadres of that town. Don Pedro Zuniga had written to the place where Daniel's uncle lived asking for his information. He had addressed the parish priest, whom he did not know, and it was not long before he received a long letter in which the priest gave him the best news regarding the honesty and industriousness of that man who was the town schoolteacher. He received such a small salary that it was barely enough to cover his needs. The gentleman, who was an influential person, managed to get his pay increased and, once this was done, he called Daniel and told him, Your uncle can already have you by his side leave with him until I achieve his transfer to this place. For which I will need some time. When you reside here you will take care of your field, which is good and will produce a regular income. With the school and what the land gives you will live comfortably. The trip will be paid for by my children. Who are interested in you, I think you will not refuse this little service from some children, your companions by age and by inclinations. How to thank enough. Daniel began with a touched accent. Always being honest and hard-working, Don Pedro interrupted him. The boy moved away from the place, his absence lasting about a year. Sometimes he wrote to his benefactor who always answered him with affection. In mid-April the uncle was transferred to the other school and as soon as the teacher who was to replace him arrived, the good man and his nephew headed for the town where the boy had met Zuniga. They arrived at night and sought lodging at the inn until the following morning, which was April. 25. This day they went to the church to attend the blessing of the fields with the entourage. They heard some men say that the mayor of the previous year had been dismissed, replacing him with Don Pedro by the will of the entire neighborhood, and that the former cacique, unable to suffer his defeat, had sold everything he owned, going to live in his wife's town where no one was. He listened to him. That there devoured their impotent rage without pity on him. Daniel's surprise was great when he saw that the three priests followed by almost all the inhabitants of the place were heading towards the west side and that there the first field they blessed was his own. And his astonishment grew even more when he found his lands planted and his little house restored, which before was dilapidated, everything was carefully cared for, promising a very abundant harvest. 
Daniel led his uncle to Don Pedro's side, at whose feet he wanted to throw himself, which the gentleman prevented by embracing him affectionately. What I have done for you has been my first act of justice, Zuniga told him, I have remedied the evil that my predecessor, the unworthy mayor, caused you. With the arrangement of your fields, I have provided work for not a few workers who lacked it. Keep those you need at your service, and work yourself, work hard and if you have more money than you need, give it to the poor as God commands us and he will bless and protect you always. Daniel did so, first of all helping old Dorotea. His field was the most beautiful in that town without ever losing a harvest or having to suffer any of the innumerable plagues that ruined so many unfortunate farmers, thus rewarding the Lord to the poor boy who was so persecuted during his childhood for the misfortunes that befell him. They reigned without deserving any. Chapter 2 May, The Flowers To my nieces Matilda and Margarita Esteban Valdez on Ascension Day, eight girls from the Santa Teresa School had received communion for the first time, and many of their older classmates and not a few sisters had also taken communion with them. The solemn mass had not been attended by more than the relatives of the students, to whom ballots had been given. And the president of the college, an illustrious lady, good and charitable, who possessed a considerable fortune. Of those eight girls, seven were from wealthy families, only Pilar was the daughter of a poor woman who could have the child in such an elegant school because a very rich cousin of hers paid for it. But since she only received this favor, the girl would not have been able to make her first communion in the same outfit as her classmates, if a neighbor who had had it for two years, because a daughter of hers had worn it, had not lent it to her. Pilar had, then, received the sacred host dressed in white, with the long, flowing veil and the flower crown. The same neighbor had given her a curly candle and her mother a prayer book with ivory covers that she had from when she was little. The chaplain had given a short, simple talk, and then the girls had knelt two by two on the carpeted steps. The ceremony had lasted a scant hour. But the day's party did not end there. Every afternoon the flowers of Mary were made and the sisters and schoolgirls who knew music sang in the choir. It had been arranged that the girls who had made their first communion offered bouquets to the Virgin reciting elusive poetry. As the bouquet was, so would be the verses, there were them for all kinds of flowers and Pilar had learned some short ones, taking into account the nun who had taught her her shy character. The girl had to deposit some roses at the feet of the sacred image. The bouquets were brought to the schoolgirls from their homes and they were almost all precious, more or less large, but tasteful and valuable. Only Pilar did not have flowers and she had not dared to ask her mother to make the sacrifice of spending that money for her. The Virgin knows, he thought, that I would give her the most beautiful plants if it depended on my will but the people who see that I don't carry my offering like my classmates will think that I am less good than them, less a believer. And the poor girl cried with real inconsolation. Sor Juana de la Cruz, the nun who gave homework and catechism lessons, had not stopped watching the schoolgirl and it didn't take long for her to understand what was going on inside her. He knew the bad position of Pilar's mother, and, wanting to remedy that pain, he searched the garden for some roses, but there was not a single one left, they had all been cut to adorn the altars of the church, especially the largest one where the Virgin of Beautiful Love. The nun did not want to remove a single flower from there, they were no longer hers or her companions, they belonged to that mother represented by a precious sculpture. Sor Juana de la Cruz went down to the church to finish fixing it and Pilar followed her. Do you give me permission to pray and meditate for a while? said the girl. Yes, my daughter, replied the sister. The schoolgirl knelt on a predio, covered her face with her hands so as not to be distracted, and remained like that for a long time. Sor Juana came and went from one place to another. 
Pilar heard a maid calling her, she noticed that the sister was leaving the temple, that she was gone for a few minutes, that she was going back in, that she was continuing her work. As soon as it brushed past the girl's outfit as it was at the other end of the church. Then everything was silent, the nun left leaving her disciple alone. She always prayed and meditated. She asked the Virgin to do a miracle for her, to send her even a flower to return it immediately. Her beautiful ideal was to have one of those roses that she had seen in the President's garden one day when she went for a walk with her companions and Sorwana. They were very large, with many petals, and through the gate he had inhaled their delicate aroma while admiring their beautiful hues. That was a dream, how could the poor and helpless girl have such a flower? Pilar was very tired and realized that her knees could no longer support her. More. Wouldn't the Virgin allow him to sit down to continue praying? He knew that the grace implored on such a day would be granted. His only aspiration was to learn many things so that when he left school he would give lessons, taking with them the well-being and rest of his mother. The nuns would protect her, as they had done with other girls who had the same idea. Her mother would not work any more, she would do everything with the help of heaven and her good teachers. Pilar sat down and closed her eyes so as not to be distracted by the lights, the flowers, and some person from the house who occasionally entered the church. At five o'clock the doors of the temple were opened. The girl, assuming that she couldn't pray any more until she did it with her companions, opened her eyes. Mechanically she smoothed the folds of her veil, and as her hands fell to her skirt her fingers found something cool and damp. He looked and saw six exceptionally large roses tied with a white silk ribbon, perhaps even larger than those in the school president's garden. The perfume they exhaled was intoxicating, but Pilar hadn't noticed it because of the strong smell of flowers in the church. How to describe his astonishment and enthusiasm at having in his hands that prodigious bouquet that he regarded as a gift from the Virgin? How happy the girl was and with what emotion she thanked the mother of beautiful love. No one asked him where they had brought him such beautiful flowers from. Some Pilar's classmates looked at them with envy or surprise. The religious function passed in the midst of the greatest recollection and at the end the girls who had made their first communion in the morning went to deposit their bouquets of flowers at the feet of the Virgin reciting at the same time the poems that they had been taught. The last one was Pilar, the astonishment of all those who heard her being great when she said the verses with such religious fervor and as much integrity as no one would have believed her capable given her timid character. Virgin of beautiful love, let Mother call you. There is no pious heart that Loves you more than mine. My fervent prayers reach You, Maria, and accept these beautiful roses at the same time as my soul. Everyone was moved when they heard the girl recite these eight lines. She received the congratulations of her teachers and the president who, by giving the schoolgirls souvenirs of the solemn party that morning, gave Pilar the most beautiful one. Only to her mother and to Sor Juana de la Cruz did the girl tell what she called the miracle of the roses. The nun smiled sweetly when she heard that story and then, hugging her disciple, she said, Love the Virgin very much and she will always protect. You. In any setback you have in life, remember the day of your first communion and you will find relief from your sorrows and comfort in your pains. Chapter 3 June, the Night of San Juan Shortly before the city hall clock struck twelve, twenty-four as we say today, almost all the inhabitants of Aldiacica were gathered in a large square where gigantic trees rose and in the center of which was a beautiful fountain. The night was clear and serene, a summer night in which the aroma of field flowers and plants that grew in the mountains could be breathed with delight. The earth was covered with grass and among it some daisies and poppies showed their finery. 
At a short distance the town could be seen, which would have no more than fifty houses and a small church. There were several orchards at the entrance and exit of the forest and in this the small square where the villagers were at the end of June 23 and beginning of the 24th, farther away rose the dark mountains with large green patches that were pines in some, bramble and broom in others. A group of young men of both sexes who had gone into the woods approached singing the well-known song. The Clover, the Clover. To catch the clover on the night of San Juan. At the stroke of twelve, the youths and children stuck their heads into the fountain's basin to the great laughter of the girls and girls who, in order not to mess up their hairstyles, gladly renounced that part of the program with which the festivities were inaugurated. Then the disputes began over who had dived first, disputes that by a miracle of God did not end with club blows like other times. The inhabitants of Aldiacica later devoted themselves to the innocent occupation of searching the grass for clover to see who could find the one with four leaves, which is the one that provides happiness. The task was difficult because the clover was very small, and as soon as they found one, even if it had three leaves, they shouted for joy, which the echo repeated as if it wanted to associate itself with the contentment of those good peasants. Finally a girl of ten to eleven years old, blonde, pale and revealing in her face deprivation and suffering, said, showing the small plant that she had sought with such eagerness, here it is, here is the four-leaf clover. All the villagers surrounded her congratulating her. That poor creature was the daughter of a widow who had four other children, three younger than her, one a little older. Although the mother worked a lot, she did not earn enough to support such a large family. They were hungry, they barely had clothes to cover their bodies and they lived in one of the most miserable houses in the area. There were very few ways of earning money there, and none of making it for others. The girl was called Margarita and her older brother Mauricio. The first put the clover between her hair holding it with a hairpin. Then began the dance that lasted until dawn. A boy from the village, the son of the judge, he approached Margarita and said, If you give me the clover that you have found, I will pay a peseta for it. The girl took it out of her head, gave those four little leaves a sad look, gave them to what everyone in the village called El Senorito and received a silver coin that represented for her the food of that day, that is, a little rest, for his unhappy mother. Then Margarita and her brother went home to sleep a little and get up at ten o'clock to go to the church function where a priest who came from the city expressly for that would give the sermon. The young man withdrew from the forest when it was already daylight, but having wanted to witness all the festivities, he did not find himself alone in his room until night. Already in it it was. Said, Tradition tells that the owner of the four-leaf clover receives a benefit for each one of them. One of these will surely be fortune and if I get it I will leave this village to lead a great life in the capital. Goodbye, then, to everything that bores me here, my mother's admonitions, my father's stale ideas, the inevitable dealings with these rustics, the financial difficulties and as many annoyances that overwhelm me. How happy I am going to be and what a good life I have to give myself. He tore off one of the pages, then another, and another, and finally the fourth. Instead of falling to the ground, the leaves floated through the air for a moment and then, driven by a gentle breeze, they flew out the window without stopping until they reached Margarita's house, where they entered and settled at the girl's feet. She saw with astonishment that her humble room, dimly lit by a candle stub, was covered in a thick fog, then illuminated with a pink light and in its splendor she saw four women of unequal beauty, dressed in white and carrying in their hands different objects. One came forward and said to Margarita, I am the wealth that never ends. I, added another of the young women, am eternal happiness. Me, murmured another, I am the beauty that does not wither. I, 
Finish the fourth, I am the virtue that does not die. The first gave the girl a box full of gold, which she put on a table, the second a talisman, the third a jewel, which Margarita also left behind, the last one a silver flower that she kept in her hand giving it preference over the other gifts, for being the emblem of virtue, but the four women said to him. Everything is for you, each of the clover leaves grants you a grace and you will be rich, happy, beautiful and virtuous. You will share your fortune with your family because the gold in that box will never end. But, interrupted the girl, that will not be mine, because I have sold the clover to a man. The goods that clover produces are for the one who finds it, not for the one who buys it. By tearing out the pages, the one who paid you for it made us present ourselves here. Goodbye lucky girl, we will protect you and we will always love you. Goodbye, replied Margarita, who was stunned, goodbye and thank you. I will never forget you. The vision vanished, the mist dissipated, but there remained the objects with which the girl had been presented. A group of boys passed through the street singing. To catch the clover on the night of San Juan. But no one found the four-leafed one that grows in the grass. And while the gentlemen continued to be bored in town, Margarita Smotis' family lived rich, happy, in that little house in which she had been born, enlarged and restored, having bought land where Mauricio worked, and the children being able to receive a careful education, all of them being for his excellent behavior and his luck, the envy of the bad and the joy of the good. Part 2 The Summer Asterisk when Don Mario Penalver returned to town in the summer with the intention of staying there for a few days as usual, Mercedes and Raphael, who were waiting impatiently for him, went in the car with his father to meet him at the station. The old man brought them books and toys bought in Madrid, which the children gave him. They were very grateful. The godfather saw in his possession the trees laden with fruit, the harvested wheat, and he rejoiced when he learned that his godchildren had entertained themselves during the afternoon raking in the threshing floors. They were strong and robust and that peasant life proved them very well. Don Mario wanted the day after his arrival to pay a visit to his settlers and she was accompanied by her nephew, his wife and Mercedes and Raphael. When the farmers found out about the master's project, they had erected arches of branches through which they had to pass and as the interesting group approached they launched an endless number of rockets into the air, of which, because it was daylight, only a little smoke could be seen being heard in the air. Changed a thunderous noise. The young men and women had put on their gala costumes, wearing wild flowers in their hair. The boys and girls sang a hymn welcoming the Lord, and all, regardless of gender or age, cheered their lord with sincere enthusiasm and true joy. The old man was deeply moved. Raphael, who knew how many boys lived there, observed that Jacinto and Leon were missing, two sons of as many guards from those lands. Would they be sick? He saw their mothers who were together and who were somewhat related and close friends. And children? Mercedes' brother asked them. They have stayed at home punished, answered one of the women. And tied up, answered the other, because if they didn't they would escape. Well, what have they done? Don Mario questioned that he was going nearby and had found out about the conversation. They are very bad, sir, murmured one of the mothers. They kill the little birds in their nests, they destroy or pour water on the anthills, they spoil the plants with stones or sticks and there is no one to make a run for them. You scold them for all that, right? Yes, sir, we scold them, we hit them, we leave them without eating, we lock them up. And you have not tried to speak to them with sweetness. So that, replied one of them, they were not to listen to us. Who knows? You would have to try it. Are they near here? Yes, 
Sir, in that house that you can see on the right, we have left them together, but they are tied to the chairs and cannot leave. Don Mario wanted to see the boys and entered with their mothers, their nephews, and the children into a large room on the ground floor of one of the houses that he gave free to his guards. The culprits were there at a distance from each other, tied up and suffering their punishment in very different ways. Leon, full of rage, cried loudly, hurling imprecations from that mouth that only beautiful and simple phrases should pronounce. Jacinto was embarrassed, his head bowed on his chest, a wash in tears down her cheeks and without uttering a single word. Don Mario approached him first and asked him affectionately. Why do you kill God's little birds? Why do you undo the anthills? Do birds or ants hurt you? Do they bother you about something? No, sir, the boy murmured. The birds, the old man continued, make us happy with their songs, they destroy a thousand insects in the fields that are harmful to our crops and the ants are hard-working and harmless. Tireless, during the summer, sometimes carrying weights far beyond their strength, they save for the winter what they now find on their way without being daunted by anything and setting an example to many industrious men. Have you ever thought about this? No, sir, repeated the child, I didn't even know. Do you do it because your partner tells you to? Jacinto remained silent, not wanting to accuse his friend. The old man then approached Leon, who did not stop shouting. And you, asked Don Mario, why do you mistreat animals? Because you have so bad heart. Because I don't like them, answered the boy, and because I can destroy them whenever I feel like it, they are less strong than me they do not stand up to me. I already know you both, replied the knight, and if your parents listen to me, which I hope, I will separate the weeds from the wheat, as farmers do. May Jacinto not see Leon again, may his mother advise him well, and it will not take long for him to modify what, more than bad instincts, is the detrimental influence of his friend. As for Leon, we will lock him up in a school, which is almost a correctional facility, where rigid teachers change his perverse nature. Do you accept? And very recognized, said the mother of the bad boy. When I return for the autumn I will find out if these creatures have operated the change that I hope and desire. They continued walking afterwards and Don Mario asked his godchildren their opinion regarding what to do with the birds and the ants. We. Mercedes said, we like birds very much and we don't allow anyone to go near the nests. Near the anthills we throw grains of wheat or rice and crumbs of bread and we entertain ourselves watching how the ants carry it away, everything disappearing in a moment because many go out to work, even the smallest ones that can barely carry their load. They had come to an extensive cornfield where some sunflowers grew proud and graceful. What a big flower! Raphael exclaimed. Too bad it doesn't smell. Mercedes added. I know a fable about her, said the godfather. Do you want to recite it for us? With pleasure. And the old man began this way, says. More than a serious being. That the source equals that the flower and. The bird know how to speak an unknown language that its soft rumor is in the source and in the plant perhaps it is the aroma. This is undoubtedly a fact, although an astonishing one, for I know that a pleasant afternoon, a proud and boastful angry sunflower, exclaimed in this way, I order to cut every day small flowers from this park the Master, when with only four of mine an elegant bouquet can be formed. How the soul is deceived, which is obfuscated. My golden petals never observe and the violet seeks that fearfully hides among the grass. He does not admire my arrogance, my colors, 
When passing by me, me, who should be among the flowers what the sun compared to other stars. And this listening, replied a source that was indifferent to that question, you complain. Without reason, because keep in mind that the world offers you a lesson, where the one who holds merits is despised, instead rewarding the one who hides them. Modesty is a gift, pure, precious, that finds its own sparkle to show off, he understands, vain, that what is big and showy is not always the most useful and beautiful. This is true, Godfather, said the girl when the old man finished reciting the fable. I know that all plants are useful for something, you have told me and Dad has also explained it to me many times, but they are not equally beautiful. I would not like a bouquet of sunflowers, it would not be pretty or elegant, nor would it smell good. The source taught him a lesson by telling him so and there is no doubt that he would take advantage of it. The walk lasted until nightfall. Already the sun had hidden behind the mountains, ox carts laden with hay were returning from the fields in a huge mass, the workers returned to their homes happy and calm, some sang sweet or happy songs that the echo repeated. The birds were collected in their nests and the crowing of the rooster or the cooing of the doves was not heard. The bell of a village not far away, made up of two dozen houses and a church, rang out the nine peals of the prayer and Don Mario and his companions stopped, the old man, his nephew, and Raphael taking off their hats. The angel of the Lord announced to Mary, the Godfather began. And after they had prayed the Angelus, they headed towards their house, which they entered at night. Will you remember a story for tomorrow? Mercedes asked the owner of those vast lands. Yes, he answered, I have prepared those that correspond to the three months of summer. We will listen to them with great pleasure, said Raphael. And we will learn them to repeat them later to other children, added Mercedes. Fulfilling what was offered, Don Mario narrated the following three stories with a clear voice and ease of speech. Chapter 1 July, The Reaper's Dream Florencio was a Galician who had left his poetic village to go to a distant land with a gang of reapers. It was the first time he had been separated from his mother, a good woman who, according to her baptismal certificate, was still quite young, but who looked like an old woman from her appearance. He saw her with the eyes of his soul, with her beautiful black hair studded with silver threads, her sad gaze, her hands calloused from work, her bare feet, poorly dressed in miserable clothes. Florencio had no father, he had died in a shipwreck, and the rest of his family was made up of two blonde and pink girls, still too young to help their mother with her chores. They had a little house in town and a piece of land surrounded by tall cornfields. A vine that gave large bunches of black grapes in the autumn and some vegetables made up the entire fortune of those poor people. The beautiful ideal of the good woman was to have a cow, but, despite the incredible economy with which she lived, although she made exquisite lace to sell them in the nearby towns, she had managed to gather very little in several years of incessant work. To bring some money to his mother, Florencio had left his village. If I had twenty dollars more than what I can earn mowing, my mother said to herself, I would buy one of those red and small cows from my town that give such good milk and that would provide us with food and leave enough to sell. My mother would work on her tiptoes like now, but she wouldn't till the land, I would do that, and my little sisters would take the milk to some houses where they have told us they would buy it if we had a cow. If I dared to play the lottery. But, what if I don't fall for it and I lose the money? Fixing this idea in his mind, he asked a reaper from the gang he worked in if he wanted to play with him, he accepted and they agreed that Florencio would take a tenth of three pesetas, giving half the money each. 
The tenth was kept by the man who gave the boy the number on a piece of paper, badly written, but clear enough to be read. A few days passed, the draw arrived, the list was published, and the reaper said to Florencio, We have had bad luck, we have not received anything, you can tear the paper that you. I came up with the number. But the Galician did not break it, although he told the other that he had. The tasks that led them to that field were coming to an end. The harvest was done, not without work because the sun was scorching. At siesta time the whole crew would lie down to sleep in the field, looking for what little shade there was, now next to a wall, now at the foot of a tree. That month of July had been exceptionally hot and the poor reapers, sweaty, panting, ardently wanted to return to their fields. Galician towns to breathe in the aroma of its fields, to enjoy its soft breezes, to admire its lofty mountains, to eat the tasty fruits of its trees or its vines. Poorly dressed, less well fed, their heads covered with large straw hats that barely protected them from the rigors of the season, they counted the days that remained of that painful work that was happily about to end. One afternoon, the penultimate that they had to stay there, Florencio was sleeping peacefully in the farthest part of that extensive field, with his hat thrown over his face to avoid the sun's rays. He dreamed that a boy with a very precious face had approached him, putting a 100 pesetas bank note in his hand, saying, Here, this is the money your mother needs to buy the little red cow. That has to bring the slack to your house. Before he could thank him, the boy had spread his wings like a dove and had taken flight, soaring, so high, that he had not taken long to lose sight of him. When Florencio woke up, there was still half an hour to go before work resumed. He wanted to walk around a bit before starting the job and he walked among the bundles of wheat that carpeted the field. Suddenly he stopped because his feet had tripped over an object. It was a rather large and very bulky leather wallet. The boy sat on the ground, opened it and was dazzled. It was full of banknotes and gold coins. That represented a fortune, there was money to buy many cows, to bring joy and wealth to his good mother and his little sisters, the little girls with blonde hair. She put her wallet in the pocket of her blouse and continued her walk meditatively. That money was not his, that money could belong to someone who needed it, would he have the right to keep it? If no one claimed it. His conscience as a good and honest child told him that it was necessary to restore what chance had made him find. He saw from afar his master who was looking for something among the bundles of wheat, seemed upset and in a bad mood. No doubt he had lost his wallet. Bah! The master was rich and that handful of bills would not represent much or make a dent in his fortune. Florencio was almost determined not to return the wallet, she looked up at the sky as if to consult him and it seemed that up there, very high, almost next to the sun, the little angel she had dreamed of was moving away, waving its wings and crying over the wickedness of men. Florencio went to the place where the master was and asked him with a tremulous voice, Sir, have you lost something? The master answered somewhat upset. Yes, a large wallet with money that I needed for a payment that I had to make today. Here it is, the boy murmured, handing over the found object. The man opened the wallet, counted what was in it, saw that nothing was missing, looked with surprise the boy in keeping the money, he said. Okay, you vedon your duty, you'll always be an honest man. And he walked away without giving her anything. Florencio undertook his work happy to know that he was worthy of those words. He had had the fortune in his hand, but he was not unaware that by this means his mother had refused it. There was no cow, for that year at least. The Galician boy who had spent the afternoon helping to lock up the wheat in the barn, noticed the absence of the man who had played the lottery with him, he shared it with his co-workers, no one had seen him. Almost at night, 
Some reapers found him in the middle of the field, stretched out on the ground, he had died of sunstroke. They notified the master, who made him move to his house, informing the judge of what had happened. Great was the astonishment of all when they found sewn to that wretch savest a bag containing nearly two thousand duros in bills. Where could that money come from? A tall, dry old man, called Uncle Camillas, a countryman of the deceased and of Florencio, a man who was all kindness, all heart, called his master aside and said to him, the reaper who has died had played a tenth to the lottery with that little boy that I brought to the crew this year recommended by his mother, he said that nothing had fallen, but who knows if he tricked the boy and kept the money he earned. The master questioned Florencio, he showed him the paper with the number and it didn't take long to know that the tenth had been one of the winners of the jackpot. The owner of those fields made two parts of that money, one that he allocated to the lucky child, the other that he gave to Uncle Camilla's for the widow and children of the deceased. He recommended to the old man not to part with the boy until he gave himself to his mother. Florencio Shibulation had no limits. How many cows could he buy with those tickets? The master, who had kept them in a bag, gave it to the boy he said goodbye to. With the greatest affection. The old man and his companion left for their land. Florencio fell asleep on the train and dreamed that the little angel who had appeared to him on other occasions, beautiful and smiling, had put something into the bag his master gave him, the same perhaps that he found. When he arrived at his town where his mother and little sisters were waiting anxiously for him, when he told them what had happened, he put the bank notes on a table and saw, surprised, that there were, in addition to the thousand dollars, fifty more that everyone supposed his master had given him as a reward for his love. Honesty, all with the exception of Florencio, who believed that the little angel of his dream had always placed them with the other bills. Uncle Camilla's, who had no family, went with Florencio and his family and lived with them happily and peacefully, being considered by the woman as if he were their father and loved by the children as if he had been their grandfather. In that house peace and happiness reigned forever. Chapter 2 August, The Procession Those two motherless girls, whom the mother had always called Consuelo and Gracia, inspired the greatest compassion in all the neighbors in the neighborhood. The father, a man without beliefs, continually stuck in taverns drinking or playing, had the poor creatures in the greatest abandonment. Shortly after getting married he had left for America, he had spent six years in Chile and Peru returning with some money and with those girls whom he only named Chilean and Panamanian. Not that they were bitches! exclaimed the good women who lived near that family, those are not Christian names. The man, whose name was Gilberto, had forbidden his wife to speak to the girls about religion and to teach them to pray, but the excellent mother, when her husband was away, tried to instill in those tender souls the beautiful sentiments that she felt. Adorned their hearts, making them repeat the prayers that were a soothing for their sorrows. Unfortunately, the good woman died when she was most needed, leaving those girls alone. Gilberto was very bad. When he left he locked his door and the creatures were locked up. He gave them little to eat, left them to be covered in rags, and he spent what was left of the money he brought from America on giving himself the best possible life. A neighbor lady of hers dared to tell her one day, you must have taken the girls to a school, they will be raised as savages. I've already thought about it, he replied. They are going to found a Protestant school and as soon as the project is carried out they will spend many hours there. The Catholics of the town, who are almost all its inhabitants, will prevent the school melts down. Well, if you succeed, replied Gilberto, Chilean and Peruvian will continue locked up as they are now because that's what suits me as their father. No one but me has the right and authority over those girls who are of no use to me. If their mother had lived longer, leaving them older, 
They would have been useful to me helping me with their work to earn a living, but they are so small like this for me. The poor girls grew up in the same abandonment, without speaking to anyone, walking only in the courtyard behind their house, whose high walls prevented them from seeing their neighbors' houses. One beautiful afternoon in August, on the 15th, the two little sisters were playing when they heard distant music. What will that be, Chilean? Asked the youngest. I don't know, replied the other. It is a very pretty thing and I would give a good thing, if I had it, to see what the instruments they play are like. Do you want, continued the one they called Peruana, that we try to bring the ladder that is in the house and we climb up the wall? It will weigh a lot. We will bring her dragging her when we lack the strength. And said and done. The two little girls went into the house, whose windows facing the street were always closed, they took the stepladder and, with some difficulty or effort, they took it out to the patio and leaned it against the wall. Once this was accomplished, the little one went up first, helped by the older one, and sat on the edge of the wall, then the other girl did the same. A beautiful field with tall trees, land planted with vegetables, and a long street of poplars appeared at the end of which they could make out a tower with a cross, the chapel of the Virgin that they had not visited for years, since long before. Of dying his mother. The procession came along the boulevard to take the most holy image to the parish where a solemn salve was sung and then returned, crossing the entire town, by a different path, to stay again in the small church. The bells rang in celebration and many people crowded at the foot of the wall to see the procession. The march was led by several men with banners whose ribbons carried beautiful girls dressed in white, then the sacristan with the sleeve of the parish, the people who made up the brotherhood with lighted candles, the clergy who were followed by the miraculous image on golden litters, the virgin, a stature assumption, in a blue tunic and red cloak with her beautiful eyes fixed on the sky and her feet resting on white clouds, and finally the municipal band, made up of a dozen men and boys in blue uniforms and gold braid. As the image of the Virgin passed by, people knelt down and the women prayed the hail aloud. Gilberto stood daughters followed the procession with attentive eyes, Memories of their early years were awakened when their mother took them in the procession and made them pray before that blessed image. And without saying anything, at the risk of killing themselves, they knelt on the wall and loudly followed the prayers of the people at the foot of the wall. God save you, queen and mother. The queen their father had wanted them to forget, the only mother they had left. Tears shone in her eyes and the crowd gazed at them with emotion, afraid they would fall and wanting to do something for those poor souls. The procession slowly moved away, the girls kneeling until they were out of sight. The older one went down first to support the little one on the ladder as she had done on the way up, and when they both saw themselves again in the courtyard without a horizon and isolated from the rest of the town, they embraced each other crying. From today, said Chilina, you will call me Consuelo and I will name you Gracia. We will carry these precious names of the Virgin that our mother gave us, so that the Queen of Heaven protects and protects us. They no longer wanted to play that afternoon, they spoke only of the procession feeling not to stop by there again to see her again. The next day a pious hand threw them under the door several images representing God, the Virgin and various saints and many sheets printed with prayers that they read so repeatedly that they learned them by heart. The main ladies of the town offered Gilberto to take charge of their daughter's education without getting anything and the poor creatures would have continued in the same state of ignorance if one day their father had not been injured in a brawl caused by wine and gambling. He was taken to the hospital and the girls were protected by a relative of their mother, a widow, childless, who took them home, dressed them and fed their bodies with healthy delicacies and their spirits with beautiful doctrines, managing to save those souls. When Gilberto was cured, they found him a job in America and, 
since he no longer had a room, he accepted, deciding that he would go alone. When he saw his daughters, he almost did not recognize them. He wanted to say goodbye to them before leaving. Here you have Consuelo and Gracia, they told him. He did not dare to give them other names. He kissed them, more moved than he would have been. Expected, and walked away. The misfortunes he suffered in America made him mend his ways and from there he wrote affectionate letters to his daughters, whom he would not see again for many years. The girls were happy next to the lady who protected them and while they were little they carried the ribbons of the banner of the Virgin in the procession that was held every year on August 15. They were dressed in white and crowned with flowers, asking with sweet songs and beautiful prayers the complete conversion of their father and the help of the Mother of Heaven, next to whom would undoubtedly be the one who was both on earth. Chapter 3 September, The Huntress Diana the Hunter, they called the daughter of the Count of San Felipe, all of his acquaintances. She was a beautiful girl who, when she was barely three years old, had lost her mother and to whom her father had given a completely manly upbringing. He would have wanted a son and heaven had not given him any more offspring than that creature who, contrary to all the tastes and inclinations with which nature had endowed her, rode a horse very well, hunted to perfection, handled the bicycle like a consummate cyclist and knew neither the tasks nor the toys of his sex. The father was happy like this and Diana seemed content with her lot. For the first of September, the opening day of the hunt, the Count had invited many of his friends, ladies and gentlemen, to go to a large estate that he had in the province of Toledo, where he hoped to spend a delicious week devoted to your favorite distraction. He had given his daughter a beautiful horse and a fine gun for the hunting party. Diana had received both gifts with gratitude, but without enthusiasm. All the people of the nearby town had come out onto the road to see the superb cavalcade made up of many Amazons, among whom the Count's daughter stood out for her youth and beauty, several knights in hunting clothes, numerous servants, and many clean dogs. Well cared for, what an important role they had to play in those days. Two children from six to eight years old had gone ahead of the young lady, who led the horse at a walk like her companions so as not to run over the crowd that came out to meet her, giving Diana two bouquets of field flowers that she accepted with appreciation. The girl, who was the oldest, was dressed in a little white dress, the one used on holidays, and the boy in a grey one with shorts and a blouse of the same colour. Both had brown hair, skin tanned by the sun's rays, cheerful and smiling countenance, and a certain distinction in their bearing that contrasted with that of the other villagers. Diana found out who they were, knowing from the servants that the father of those boys was one of the guards of the Count's possession. When the expedition members arrived at this, they had a sumptuous lunch and then the hunt began, each one occupying the position that was designated for him. That day many pieces were collected and the hunters, who had enjoyed themselves in big, they went to bed exhausted after dinner. At dawn they were all up and ready to spend the day like the day before. The Count's daughter, who was tired of spending so many hours at the post, suggested to one of her friends that they take a walk around the estate carrying the shotguns in case there were opportunities to hunt something. A servant followed them at a respectful distance and the dog Tun, who was his mistress' favorite. He suddenly stopped at one of the most beautiful places along the way. Attention, said the girl, there must be a rabbit around here and he was about to take aim when he saw two children come out from behind some bushes, who threw themselves at his feet. The dog kept sniffing. How reckless! Diana exclaimed, we could have fired without seeing you and caused a disgrace. Rise up and answer. He paid close attention to the creatures and recognized in them the ones that had been given to him the day before. The Bouquets of Flowers 
what do you want? Ask them. You speak, Guadalupe, said the boy to his sister. Miss, the girl began, forgive my audacity, but Minguin lives in that burrow with his wife and children, and I beg you not to kill them. We have known them since they were born and we all love them very much. When we approach and bring them something to eat, they come out and are not scared of us. But are you talking about a family of rabbits? Diana asked, with interest. Yes, miss, answered Guadalupe. The father was born on a Sunday about a year ago, we called him first Dominguin and then to make the name cuter, Minguin, his father and mother were hunted when he was very young and we brought him food, so he has always loved us very much. Today he is not frightened by the shots, neither is his wife nor his children, but the dog will take them out and if you kill them my little brother Pablo and I will be very sorry. But, said the Count's daughter, if they stay there, anyone will hunt them down, if not today another day. Why don't I take them to your house? Or is there nowhere to have them? Yes, miss, in our house there is a large corral with a rabbit hutch, but it is empty because these rabbits are not ours and my father does not want us to take them with us, and with good reason. Well, Diana went on, tell your father that he has permission to take them and lock them up there. Mine, who is very accommodating and denies me nothing, will agree to my request, approving what I do. Tomorrow I will go to your house and I hope that the rabbits are already in the corral. Where do you live? There, answered the girl, pointing to a small one-story house that could be seen between the trees a short distance away. Well, see you tomorrow, Guadalupe and Pablo. She affectionately kissed the children, called imperiously to Tun, who did not want to leave the burrow, and continued on her way followed by her friend, the servant, and the dog. At lunchtime, he told his father what had happened to him with the sons of the guard, and the count was pleased with what his daughter had done. The next day Diana, accompanied by the same friend with whom she was going the day before and by a servant who brought some game destined for her charges, went to the little house at the door of which Guadalupe, Pablo, and their mother, a simple tall and robust. The guard, in compliance with his duty, was on the mountain and could not receive his lord's daughter. Diana saw all the rooms, which were spacious and ventilated, the corral where there were some chickens and a rooster, the rabbit hutch where Minguin, his wife, and half a dozen children were installed, everything very clean and tidy. But what most caught Diana's attention were Guadalupe's work, which her mother taught to sew and embroider. In addition to those decorations, she had a pad with many pins on which the girl had started a bobbin lace, which looked like a fairy work. Will you teach me how to do this? Asked the Count's daughter. Oh. Yes, miss, with a thousand loves, answered Guadalupe. And from that day on, Diana and her friend would go to the guard house, where they would leave their unloaded and idle shotguns in a corner, and they would diligently learn those tasks to which they felt more attracted than hunting. Sometimes they ate lunch there, liking the tasty food of the peasants more than the very fine dishes that a French cook seasoned. The hunt that should have lasted a week lasted many more days. Diana already knew how to make wonderful lace and other tasks, when Guadalupe showed her a doll that her mother had bought for her at the town fair in September of the previous year for the Virgin de las Mercedes. The said doll was neither good nor pretty, but it was dressed with such grace that it immediately captivated the Count's daughter, and when the fair arrived again, Diana went there with Pablo, her mother and her little sister, and as always she had money that her father gave her. She bought many toys for the children from the guardian and bought for herself a precious baby whose layette she worked with not a little help and direction from her new friends. The Count's surprise was great when he entered his daughter's room one morning to find her rocking the doll in her arms, surrounded by fabrics and clothing for the baby and on the other side the bobbin lace, already very advanced. 
Not knowing that Diana knew how to do this, he was astounded. But, he murmured, do you like those things? Yes, Dad, answered the girl with integrity, more than hunting and riding a horse and a bicycle. The Count remained meditative for a few moments and finally said. Perhaps you are right. If you were born a girl, why should I insist that you adopt the tastes and manners of a boy? Diana took her father to the guardshouse and the two always protected a lot to its inhabitants. Since then, the girl shared the time between sports to please her father and the labors proper to their sex. Minguandit of old age, leaving happy in numerous offspring. Part 3 Fall Asterisk the trees were beginning to shed their splendid foliage and the streets were covered in leaves quite thickly. The rains had begun and the sky did not display that purest blue that so enchanted Don Mario. He was, however, lucky that two days after his arrival in town the weather improved a lot, and since autumn when it is good is a delicious season that has a thousand charms, he was able to go out with the children for a walk around the estate after to eat that is, at two in the afternoon. He immediately remembered those sons of the guards who had punished their mothers for their bad instincts and asked his godsons if what he indicated had been fulfilled. Certainly, godfather, answered Mercedes, Leon was immediately taken to a school that I think you pay for. Yes, Don Mario interrupted, and I told them to put the amount to my account and it will already be paid your father. At school, the girl continued, they have treated Leon sweetly and they assured that the boy does not seem the same as before. They say that sometimes, watching him from afar, they have let him go down alone to the garden and that he has not returned to catch the birds in the nests to kill them or destroy the anthills. On the contrary, he has thrown them breadcrumbs and has been pleased to see how the parents of the little birds took the biggest ones in their beaks to give them to their young and how the smallest ones were put into their houses by the ants. And the other child? The old man asked. Jacinto, answered Raphael, he is now our friend, he has become very good and he cries when he remembers the damage he did to the animals in another time and the damage he caused to the plants. We don't want him to talk about it, Mercedes objected. But he insists on doing it to punish himself, added Raphael. And there was no further discussion of this matter. They continued their walk, entertaining the children by stepping on the dry leaves. At every moment they found, with loads of firewood, men who wished them good afternoon and continued on their way with the peace of mind of one who knows that he is authorized to bring to his poor and cold home what will provide him with comfort and warmth. The old man allowed the unfortunate peasants to do it and there were many blessings that fell on him for such a unique benefit. At the foot of a hill they found a boy between ten and twelve years old who, doubtless exhausted from a long walk and unable to resist the weight of the firewood, had dropped it on the ground and rested his head on it, beautiful and weather-beaten. The rays of the sun and the air, he slept soundly. There was something sad and bitter in the expression of that face, something unbecoming of his young age, as if he had premature sorrows or lived isolated in the world. Mercedes and Raphael hardly knew him, he wasn't the son of any settler and they had only heard that he lived now in one town, now in another that charity provided him. But, Godfather, said Raphael, how can this boy sleep on such a hard pillow? Custom, my son, answered the old man, perhaps he has not known another bed than the floor, and he has a good dream. Let him rest that maybe he shappy now and awake he suffers the rigors of a fate he doesn't deserve. If you need it, we will know, because we will find you again. You are in charge, if I did not see him in these days, to look for him and help him. Your father will give you in my name the money you need for it. Now we will go back home so you can have a snack. Can't I guess what we like to drink now in the afternoon, alternating with autumn fruits? I don't know, 
my children. Well, honey and bread, not much because our mother says it would hurt us. Godfather, said Mercedes, recently we have seen the honey being taken from the hives. The men had to cover their faces with rags to get close to them, otherwise the bees would have stung them. There were hundreds of these around the honeycombs and if some unfortunate man was careless they would sting him. They have taken a lot of honey and a lot of wax, Raphael continued, bees are very useful little animals. At home there are already enough pots full of honey, the wax has been taken to make candles. I'm pleased to see how you pay attention to everything, Don Mario told them, that show you learn things imperceptibly. Near the house, the child asked the old man, Is there no fable this time? I don't know any typical of the station we are in, replied the godfather. I do not remember a single one that I learned about the vines or the dry leaves, but wait, I am going to tell you something that relates to that boy who slept so soundly and with such pleasure on his load of firewood. The apologist is entitled The Force of Habit and reads as follows. An illustrious and enlightened gentleman was banished for I don't know what cause, but before embarking on a long journey he wanted to add to his fate a peasant who knew the gentleman well and followed him abroad with pleasure. As it took him a while to leave Spain, too better hide his name and class, he gave the good clothes to his servant and the latter. Put on without a care. They arrived at a place of little fame, asking travelers there for a bed, but since the inn was very small, but calm, placid and smiling, and the rooms already having guests, not wanting to leave, tired of traveling, the satisfied emigre accepted a room. With two beds, just one bed. It was agreed that the man in the peasant suit should sleep on a pile of straw, straw that they placed at the foot of the bed after the two beds were arranged. The knight lay down on the straw and his squire on the humble bed because they saw that the guest who was there with hidden intentions was watching them. The three fell asleep, the banished did. Not take long to dream. He had arrived. To quickly lay siege to a high. Impregnable fortress, and when that. Assault came to an end, he jumped. From the pile of straw and climbed up to. Bed, half asleep, thinking of the fierce fight he had won. While the farmer who dreamed that he was going down into a very deep well, he threw himself from the bed, poorly, awake in the pile of straw he was thrown. And when they were lying like this, the two of them calmly fell asleep. At dawn they woke up and both looked at each other with great surprise. Standing up quickly, the gentleman said to his servant, Dash, everyone stay with their clothes, and we will go happier, calmer, even if we have to cross. Europe, roles should not be exchanged. That what is happening today will happen. Again, we must harbor the certainty. We have both tasted what the singular force of habit can do. Thus the old man finished his fable and Raphael said as soon as he stopped speaking. That happened to the child we found, he slept so well on his hard pillow and we would not have been able to rest for a minute on it. It's just that the poor thing would be tired, Don Mario replied. The forest where they gather firewood is far away, and the load is heavy for a creature of his age. It is certain that it will serve to warm others while he will be cold. One sees in his countenance more than one trace of deprivation and suffering. Do not forget, as I have told you, to find out where he stops so that we can help him if he needs it, 
as everything suggests. They were already at the door of the house and entered the room where Don Mario used to tell the stories to the children. There they served everyone a snack and after a while. After a while the godfather began one of the stories referring to autumn, which was to be followed by two more in the following afternoons as usual. Chapter 1 October, The Bunch of Grapes The vineyards of Andres Cifuentes were the admiration and envy of the inhabitants of that town that was distinguished more than anything for its good wines. They had made a fortune from their owner, the richest in the town, who every year placed a good price on the red and white that he made cleanly, pure, without deception of any kind. No healthier or larger bunches of grapes were to be seen anywhere than the of those lands. At grape harvest time, at the beginning of October, many young women from the town found work at Andre's house, whom he paid well and treated with good manners. The youngest of all was a twelve-year-old girl, an orphan of father and mother, who lived with her aunt who had taken her in for charity. Her name was Dolores and she was admired for her activity and for her sweet and humble character. Everyone commanded her and she always obeyed without replying. Cifuentes only son loved her very much, he was a boy the same age as the girl, mischievous, but good at heart. The harvest was coming to an end, the girls filled the baskets with black grapes. Or green and the master watched over everything and gave orders to those who served him. Stopping in front of Dolores, he told her, pointing to a cluster of heavy truly extraordinary that it was not cut yet. You put this one on top of the others, I want to serve it at the table to the bishop who will come to make his pastoral visit. His Excellency is from this town and when he was with us, before entering the seminary, he had a passion for grapes. If you don't eat these, they will be given to you along with other things that the town has to offer you. So be very careful with that bunch, so that it doesn't get crushed, that it doesn't get spoiled, I have my pride in him. Saying this, he walked away. Dolores finished her task by placing the beautiful grapes chosen by Andres to give to the bishop above all the others. At that moment the son of Cifuentes appeared. He was wearing his suit from the days of party, he was wearing a new hat and gloves. Where are you going so nice? Asked the girl. I am going, he replied, to wait in the neighboring place for the bishop representing my father with the priest and the mayor here. We are going in a beautiful carriage that we have rented. I wanted to say goodbye to you before and eat some grapes. Thanks for the first. As for the second, you can take what you want, not being this cluster that is on top and is the best. What a harvester, exclaimed the boy, looking around him, who? Some grapes have been left there that are delicious. You have not registered all the strains. Dolores saw that she had indeed been careless and set out to remedy it. Looking if there were still more grapes. Meanwhile Antonio, the son of Cifuentes, had approached the basket and picked up the cluster that was on top to examine it. Wow some grapes! He said, how delicious they must be! Who would appreciate them better than I? nor to whom would my father give them more gladly. He has nothing in the world but me. Wow if I dare with a cluster like this and even if it were bigger, there isn't. And he began to eat the grapes and he hurried so much that when Dolores returned he no longer had more than a dozen left. Here, here, he said, putting them in the girl shand, try them and see if they are a good thing. I'm sure you haven't eaten a single one and that's nonsense when there are so many. Dolores, not suspecting that those grapes were from the bunch destined for the bishop, ate them, finding them delicious. Then Antonio said goodbye to her and it was when she was alone that she noticed the lack of the bunch that her master had recommended. The baskets were placed in a large room. Dolores trembled at the thought that Cifuentes would scold her, 
dismiss her forever, when she asked for the grapes that she could not present. She did not dare accuse Antonio, whom she loved very much and who had not acted out of malicious intent or suspected that this could harm anyone. The time has come to arrange the table for the bishop to sit at. There were flowers, sweets, cakes on the tablecloth, all that was missing was the fruit. Andres asked the girl for the bunch of grapes. We'll put it alone in a fruit bowl to make it look better, said the master. Dolores did not move, with his eyes fixed on the ground, he awaited the punishment that would not be long in coming. Didn't I hear me, lass? Sifuentes asked with some impatience. Sir, the girl stammered, is that the cluster, what happened? I don't know, but he's not here any more. Did you eat it? No, sir. Would you swear you haven't tried it? No, Dolores couldn't swear to that, because she was very suspicious that the grapes Antonio had given her were from the big bunch. He lowered his head and did not answer. Get out of my sight, Sifuentes shouted, and don't let me find you around here again. You have been mean, disobedient, because I had told you not to touch those grapes, thief, because. They were not yours. Apologize, apologize at least. The girl did not answer, she was crying silently wiping her tears that she wanted hide his master. His Excellency is coming, said a servant of Andres. He started running to see the bishop arrive. All the harvesters followed him, only Dolores remained in that same place without daring to take a step. The reception given to the prelate was brilliant and he entered his native town full of emotion and sweet joy. There his parents had lived, there he had spent. During the smiling years of his childhood, he had left that poetic corner to continue the studies to which his determined vocation led him. He found many old comrades, blessed them all, and the crowd rushed to kiss his ring and welcome him. He entered the church under a canopy, remained there for a long time, and then went to Sifuente's house, where they had prepared his lodging for him because he was the one with the best conditions. As he sat down at the table, Andres noticed that the grapes were missing from the fruit bowls. He had for his excellency, he told the prelate, a cluster like there was no other like it. Don't mind if you no longer have it, the bishop interrupted him, I don't like grapes. How have eaten so many here as a child? Tomorrow you will give me melon, I saw a superb melon grove passing by and your son told me it sires. A huge weight was lifted from Sifuentes when he saw that his grace no longer liked grapes. He wouldn't heaven have noticed his cluster. In any case, what Dolores had done deserved an exemplary punishment and he had to give it to her. All the harvesters were given gifts the next day, which was October 7th, when the Virgin del Rosario was celebrated that year, with a lunch, except for the poor girl. Antonio noticed her lack and asked her father about her. Andres told his son what had happened. If that SWHY he's not here, replied the boy, you can tell him to come take my place because I'm culprit. She asked me not to touch that bunch and while she finished the harvest, I ate it. It was so beautiful. Dolores would have noticed that those grapes had disappeared but she wouldn't they've told you anything because she wouldn't want to accuse me. I gave him a dozen grains, but it was not easy for him to suspect then that they were from that cluster. It may happen to me over time what happened to the bishop, that I don't like grapes, but that day has not yet arrived. So I'm going to find Dolores. Do what you want, answered Sifuentes. The boy began to run and ten minutes later he returned with the girl whom the master received with affection, making her occupy a preferential place at the table, next to Antonio. The poor girl, informed by him of what had happened, was beside herself with joy. 
the master had done her justice and would let her work in his vineyards whenever the opportunity arose. To make matters worse, it happened that the bishop asked if he had any relatives left in the town and then it was found out that a cousin and a niece of his lived there, who were Dolores and the woman who had protected her. His Excellency, after talking a lot with them and convinced that they were worthy of being protected by him, gave them a pension from his private pocket with which they could live well, although without stopping working for it. The bishop also gave alms to the poor of the town, so the day he left there to continue the pastoral visit, the people came out en masse to see him off, cheering him, while he blessed them, moving away moved and satisfied from the place where he was born. Some years later he returned there to marry Dolores and Antonio who, to the great joy of Andres Cifuentes, took home the pearl of the young women of that land, the gentle harvester of other times, and her elderly aunt. And in the spacious dwelling where well-being already reigned, joy also reigned, the sweet peace of the happy home, the happiness of the families that God blesses. Chapter 2 November, the Everlasting the coat of arms of the Duke of Roble, one of the most illustrious and richest lords of a province in the south of Spain that there is no need to name, can still be seen at the door and on the walls of his castle, which is no longer in ruins. It is inhabited and that its current owner has not wanted to rebuild. It presents in its quarters, in the first on a field of gules, a green branch, in the second, also red, a tower, in the third, on a blue field, a sword, in the last, equally blue, an immortel. The branch is made of oak, emblem of the title, the tower in memory of a fortress taken from the enemy, the sword is the same as the one used by the first duke who was graced by a king with that title, the flower means that, according to tradition, that family would never go extinct. Male or female, there would never be a lack of heirs to the noble house. The shield is finished off by a helmet with the crest dressed in feathers of different colors. A long, long time ago, the family consisted of the duke, his wife, a daughter, and a cousin of the one who was soon to be married. He was the last poor man and lived at the expense of his illustrious relative, the bride was wealthy, of less noble class, haughty in character despite that, and very ambitious. She wanted her future husband's lack of money to be made up for with honors and dignities, and as a result the duke's cousin wanted to seize the fortune of Mr. Roble, although the latter had offered him his support, which he would never lack. The duchess led a very withdrawn life, devoting herself entirely to the care of her daughter, a beautiful six-year-old girl. Her husband, devoted almost entirely to the service of his king, frequently left his castle to go to war or to fulfill some delicate mission entrusted to him by the monarch. His cousin, whose name was Teofilo, took advantage of these absences to conspire against the owners of that fortress which, attacked from the outside, would have been impregnable, but having the enemy inside, had to surrender in a short time, and so it happened. Theophilus took his supporters, who were many, inside the castle, pretending to give them a banquet and the faithful servants, treacherously attacked, were defeated. Two loyal squires managed, giving invincible proofs of courage, to get their lady and the girl out of those walls, while a handful of braves protected their withdrawal. At some distance the two groups separated, one of the servants taking the duchess and the other her daughter, not without making an appointment beforehand at the palace of the lady's father where they were to meet. She and her savior arrived without being pursued, but old Nuno, who was carrying the tender creature in his arms, did not reach the same luck. The girl, the charming Christina, was the one most persecuted by her father's cousin, who hoped for his offspring the title and assets of the Duchy of Roble. Nuno ran tirelessly through the thickest part of the jungle, evading the vigilance of his enemies, but it didn't take long for him to feel tired and without the strength to continue on his way. He had come to a town, to his right was a wall of fair height, 
to his left some wretched houses. Still some distance away the gallop of several horses could be heard. The squire jumped over the wall without leaving his precious load and found himself in a garden with tall trees. He deposited the girl at the foot of one and then fell senseless. Christina, frightened, did not dare to make any move at once, he had fully realized the danger he was running. She heard her pursuers go by, who surely believed that she and Nuno had continued on the path without stopping, then she approached the servant and noticed that he was wounded, no doubt he had been struck by a dart as he was leaving the castle, and the poor squire had already lost much blood when he passed out. That garden must have owners, these would not be so wicked that they would refuse to help a poor wounded man. So thought the girl, who was brave like her father, and despite the darkness that reigned, she began to walk through the garden in search of the house. Everything around her was strange as well. The tall, sad trees cast a melancholy shadow, from time to time she saw wide flagstones, some surrounded by railings, then some low galleries without doors and with what she supposed hermetically closed windows, finally, among the stones and grasses, he saw many little lights that floated near the ground or ran through the air, pale and mysterious lights that instilled the fear of the supernatural and the unknown. Christina stopped there without daring to go any further. Suddenly he saw a man with a flashlight in his hand. The girl cried out in fright, and the nightcrawler strode toward her. He was a venerable old man, with a sad and pleasant face. What are you doing here alone and at this hour? I ask. She briefly told him what had happened. The old man took her by the hand and led her down a less gloomy street to a little house that stood next to a gate. He opened the door with a key that he took from his pocket, entered a small, poorly furnished room, lit a lamp, laid the girl on a modest divan, and said, I'm going to look for the wounded man and I'll come right away. Surrendered by so many different emotions, Christina fell asleep. She did not wake up for a few hours and found herself lying in a humble bed, well wrapped in coarse but clean clothes. Beside him was a poorly dressed woman, quite young and with a sweet and beautiful countenance. And Nuno asked the duke's daughter, immediately remembering the scenes of the day before. The poor old man who came with you, answered the woman, has been taken by my father and my husband to a house where he will be better cared for than here, to a hospital. As for you, you will stay with me as if you were one of my daughters until we know where your parents are and you cannot fall into the hands of your enemies. To anyone who asks you, you will tell them that your name is Marta and that you are the youngest of my girls, this is found. Currently with a sister of mine in another town. I'll dress you in her clothes and I hope that show I'll save you. The news of the capture of the castle has already reached here and it is certain that your father will not be long in learning of his cousin's treachery. That woman was married to the town undertaker, since the garden where Nuno had left Christina was a cemetery. She lived with her husband, her daughters, and her father, that old man who, while making his night rounds, had found the frightened girl when she saw the will-o'-the-wisp in one of the last courtyards of the cemetery. Christina soon became friends with Marcella, the gravedigger Selda's daughter, who... She would be eight years old and she was a good and loving creature. Overcoming her fear, the daughter of the dukes played with her companion in that sad garden full of willows and cypresses, but in which the most beautiful plants grew surrounding rich mausoleums, and the birds that perch with equal joy with their trills. Tranquility in the trees chosen to shade the tombs than in the laughing gardens. And so some time passed and the day of the dead arrived. As that cemetery did not only belong to the town where it was located, but many lords from nearby castles were buried in it, the attendants at the mansion of the dead had been numerous on the first day of that month and it was almost no less on the following day. Next. 
In this they could see Christina and Marcella a superb burial and curious, like girls, they wanted to find out where they would go to bury that dead man. In the middle of a large courtyard stood a vault richer than the others, and the duke's daughter saw on a white stone a shield with four quarters in fields of red and blue, and in them an oak branch, a tower, a sword, and a always alive. The weapons of his house. Her heart pounded, and who were they taking there? Was it his father? Was it his mother? It didn't take long for him to find out. The dead man was Tiafilo, the usurper of the duke's property. He had enjoyed his crime little, dying in a brawl with an old servant of his cousin, with Nuno. The widow had ordered that he be buried in the family vault. Because it is noteworthy that as soon as he had seized the duke's fortune, Tiafilo had married the ambitious woman he had chosen as his life partner, from whom he had not had any children. The funeral procession moved away, leaving the mortal remains of the usurper in the pantheon where his ancestors lay. Christina and Marcella returned to their house. They dined and the second one went to bed. As for the first, he begged the old man to take her with him when he made his night rounds. Something prompted her to return to see the pantheon where the bodies of the deceased dukes rested before falling asleep. Although the night was not cold, fearing that the girl would get sick if she went out late or that she would be afraid when walking through the cemetery, the undertaker's wife reluctantly agreed to that whim. She bundled up Christina well, recommended that her father bring the girl to him soon, and waited up for her return. The old man immediately went to the patio where the pantheon of the Dukes of Roble stood. Arriving there, Christina was startled, and, prey to a strong dream, a strange spectacle presented itself to her excited imagination. The iron gate was open. Many skeletons had abandoned their graves and were coming out carrying the coffin where the remains of Tia Filo had been carried in the afternoon. They went in procession to one of the most remote places in the cemetery, where the pale lights of the will-o'-the-wisp could be seen, and into an open pit they threw the corpse, which they later covered with earth. No, no, they said, this body cannot be in our pantheon. We have been brave warriors, illustrious sages, men without fault, a thief, a murderer, must not rest there. They returned to their graves. Ahead of them floated the lights of the will-o'-the-wisps that seemed to illuminate the path through which the skeletons passed. The church bell launched its funeral tolls driven by an invisible hand as the doors of the pantheon closed silently. The old man took Christina, who had not yet regained consciousness, in his arms, still strong despite her advanced age. When the duke returned, he found out about the usurpation of his cousin, whom Nuno had just killed when he left the hospital completely cured, and about the disappearance of his wife and daughter. It was easy for him to find the first refugee in the palace of his parents, crying his loneliness and his misfortune, but the faithful squire did not remember where he had left the girl. The Lord of the Oak soon succeeded in throwing Tia Filo's widow out of his domain, and once he had brought the Duchess to the castle, he set about looking for Christina. One afternoon he went to the cemetery to pray at the grave of his ancestors. There something surprised him, the coat of arms was almost erased by the inclement weather and rain, only the barracks where the immortelle shone on the blue field remained intact. My daughter will appear, he told himself with conviction. Two modestly dressed girls were playing near him. The one was unknown to him, the other, oh. The other would have sworn it was hers, just as it should be then. Christine. I call. Dad. She exclaimed. He threw himself into his arms and the brave warrior wept on that adored little head. Deeply appreciative of the undertaker's family who had done so much for his daughter. The duke took her with him and gave the two men good jobs in his household. The girls Marcella and Marta, who reunited with their parents, 
were Christina's inseparable companions in her studies and in her games. The Duchess recovered her health and tranquility, but that castle, which reminded her of bitter hours, had to be abandoned for a better one that the king gave the duke as a reward for his courage and loyalty. And the tradition was fulfilled, because the family of the Dukes of Roble has not still extinct, as promised by the Immortel on its coat of arms. Chapter 3 December, The Two Births Prince Conrad was the heir to a king who figured heavily in the past century. Good, intelligent and little fond of pomp and flattery, the monarch had given his son two tutors of completely opposite characters. The one was a severe soldier who, although it is true that he treated his disciple ceremoniously, used with him all the rigors that in his opinion his high position demanded, the other, a man of science, simple and tolerant who only wanted the child in whom he instilled his knowledge to live calm and happy. The prince loved his two preceptors, took advantage of the rigidity of one to be a slave to his duty and learned from the other to look at his fellow men with affection, to forgive slight misunderstandings of etiquette or exaggerated compliance by his subjects. The soldier was really his teacher, the other was more than anything his friend, a much older friend, a disinterested and faithful adviser. Conrad had some children of the nobility as fellow students, already skilled in the art of flattery, but he did not love or esteem them. All his affection was for a son of the palace porter, who was his own age, and whose frank and sincere treatment he loved. The prince gave him toys, precisely those that he liked the most, because as his toys were constantly renewed he did not have time to become attached to anything and he knew that in the house of his little friend, who was very tidy and careful, he would always find the favorite doll, the peon that he had made dance with so much pleasure or the favorite box of soldiers. The goalkeeper's son was called Adolfo. The soldier had forbidden this child to go into the rooms that the prince had in the palace, it seemed to him that he treated his lord with excessive familiarity, but protected by the man of science, he had not been able to prevent Conrado from going very often to the porter's room, where his wife entertained him with sweets and cakes made by her, which he preferred to desserts than the confectioners of the royal house. They prepared him. There he was like family and he considered himself happy. Arrived on December 23rd, the military tutor, whose name was Don Fadric, or at least that's what we will call him, gave his disciple a superb nativity scene with great mountains, beautiful houses, precious figures, all in the midst of exuberant vegetation, branches caught in the king's gardens, which were wonderful. A river crossed the Nascimento, and in it you could see two small steamboats that gallantly plowed through the waters. A train came out of a tunnel from one of the mountains and was going to enter the bowels of another mountain, appearing again on the wide road. And above, and as astonished to see that, the kings walked on spirited steeds. Magicians, followed by their servants carrying the rich presents for the child god. The shepherds and the warriors were very unequal in size, and Don Fadric, not much of an artist, had placed a large figure next to a tiny house in several places, and a dog that was bigger than its master, completely ignoring perspective. Conrado had paid close attention to all of this without showing the slightest enthusiasm, and alone with his teacher Don Servando, the man of science, he had asked him, were there little vapors when God was born? No, my son, answered the professor, steam is a modern thing and railway. Either, that was also recently invented. Well, replied the child, I want the truth in everything, even in my games. That Don Fadrique suppressed that, that he put the figures of the nativity that are large in the foreground and the small ones in the distance, that shepherds and warriors do not wear the costumes that are used today, that there be truth in everything, as in what he tells me, as in what he teaches me. Don Servando was perplexed, guessing that those changes were not going to be to the liking of Don Fadrique. The little prince then went up to the doormanshouse, 
who had rooms for his family on the highest floor of the palace destined for servants. His parents had also named Adolfo Nascimento, very simple, but with great propriety. High mountains, palm trees and cedars, poor houses, figures that could enter through the doors without crawling, the humble doorway resplendent with light and colors to attract the gaze more than other things, shepherds with offerings, a crystalline river, a cascade that gushed from a dark rock, all set with art, with exquisite grace. How beautiful is this! Conrad exclaimed. This is a true birth, here I will come to celebrate Christmas Eve. The next day the prince aristocratic friends were invited to go to the palace. The nativity scene was illuminated with electric light and the children admired those delicacies devised by Don Fadric. But Conrado was nowhere to be found, he was not attending the party prepared exclusively for him. His parents didn't worry about it, they already knew the genius of their son and they must not have found them wrong because they neither admonished nor corrected him. He will be a great king, said the sovereign, he will have his own will. His heart will be worth a lot, the queen murmured, and everything can be expected from someone who has it noble and disinterested. Meanwhile, the prince was in the hall of the porter's room enjoying with all his soul before the beautiful birth of Adolfo. He was with his younger siblings, boys and girls, who sang, danced, played drums, tambourines and zambambas and did a thousand mischief typical of their years, which the king's son shared with them in a familiar way. When the nativity candles went out, sweets and wine were distributed there, and when the time came to part, they all did so with sorrow, promising to meet again as soon as possible. When the prince entered the red room where the aristocratic friends who had brought him to share with him the party were, in which they had been so bored, Don Fadric gave him a severe look and Don Servando smiled kindly. Tomorrow, said the first, your highness will be punished without a walk through this incomprehensible escape. The nativity will not light up any more, the delicacies that have been scattered in it will not shine for the comfort of your highness and the admiration of your guests. Conrad did not shrug his shoulders for not being disrespectful to his tutor, but he thought with pleasure that, without leaving the palace, he could go with Adolfo and his family to enjoy that nativity scene that he loved, put on by the modest servants as a gift to the prince and his children. As for Don Servando, he murmured, contemplating the heir to the throne, he likes nothing more than the truth, which he searches everywhere with determination. He will always hate flattery and lies. He will be a great king, as his father says, but alas! I fear that for this very reason I am also very unhappy. Part 4. Winter. Asterisk. That winter had been very sad and exceptionally cold. The mountains were covered with snow, the fields abandoned and silent, when Don Mario Penalver arrived in his town in a closed car, wrapped in a fur coat, with his hat pulled down over his eyes and almost completely covering his face with a scarf. As always, he was accompanied by his nephew, who had gone to wait for him at the station. Nothing new had happened in the family, the wife was in excellent health as always, and the two little peasants, Mercedes and Raphael, continued healthy and strong. Their mother did not let them leave the house except on clear days, but sometimes, when the snow covered the ground, they asked permission to make large balls or statues, which, although they were not works of art, were not without grace and they revealed no little skill. They were helped in that distraction by some children of the settlers who were friends of theirs, taking care of the choice of these the nephews of the Lord of Penalver. The car stopped at the door of the house and the children, instructed by their mother, did not go out into the garden to receive the godfather so that he could enter the hall quickly. As always, the father of Mercedes and Raphael helped his uncle to get out of the carriage, made him go into his house without stopping, 
closed the door, and after taking all these precautions, the old man found himself surrounded by his children and parents, lavishing and receiving hugs and kisses. A good fire was burning in the fireplace in the living room and near it Don Mario sat in a large armchair, facing his nephews, and at his feet, on walnut stools, his godchildren whose hair he played with, while they caressed him. Sweetly. And what has happened here during my absence? Asked the godfather. It has been intensely cold, answered the niece, it has snowed a lot. The hungry wolves have reached the town, added Mercedes. And they have killed a large number of sheep, said Raphael. Have there been personal misfortunes? The old man muttered, afraid to hear a affirmative answer. Not by a miracle, Raphael answered, but some pastors have been in danger. Let's see, tell me that, said Don Mario, I don't always have to be the one who tells the stories. Stuff. Do it, you, Mercedes, said the boy to his sister, you know how to tell it better. Talk both of you, replied the godfather, what the one does not remember that the other refers to. Well, the girl began, when there was a great snowfall here, about twenty days ago, the wolves. As I told you, came down to the town, where the shepherds are guarding the flocks at the entrance. They say that howls could be heard from the first houses in the area and that no one dared to go out after dark. They came furious and hungry and they did not take long to make great damage among the poor sheep. An old shepherd, who was the closest to the forest, was afraid of finding himself there so alone and helpless and he was so selfish that he entrusted a poor boy with the care of the sheep on the pretext that he had to go away for some time. Days. The child was that unfortunate man we found last autumn in the field and who was sleeping on the ground because he had neither a home nor a family, as we found out recently, because before we had not been able to know anything about him. He went where they called him, now in one town, now in another, with no salary other than food or some old rags to wear. This winter he was half frozen to death and when the shepherd, who knew him, told him to stay in his place tending the sheep, he accepted very gratefully. He was in a bad hut watching the snow fall, when he noticed with the greatest fright the arrival of the wolves. He looked sadly at the sheep that bleated sadly sensing danger. The dog barked furiously, as if it wanted to attack the enemy. And the wolves howled in the distance and then closer, Raphael interrupted. Yes, continued Mercedes, the shepherd boy heard the hurried steps of those beasts that were approaching the hut to surround it and then he noticed that they were pushing the door and he believed that his last hour had arrived. The boy was wearing a scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which our parish priest gave him one day because when he could he went to church to pray and help at Mass. She took it in her trembling hands, kissed it, got on her knees and asked the Mother of God for shelter and protection. And then, Raphael added, some shots were heard and then everything was silent. The next morning, continued Mercedes with a moved voice, two enormous dead wolves were seen outside the hut, each one pierced by a bullet, without being able to find out who killed them. And the other beasts fled never to return. The little shepherd was sick from the scare that happened. The miracle was told throughout the town and the priest took the child home to never be separated from him. He is an altar boy in the parish and with the alms they have given him, and that the parish priest has put in the savings bank, they have formed a small capital. Raphael and I have given him everything we had in our piggy banks. And I will add a good amount on your behalf exclaimed Don Mario. Enthusiastic about the excellent action of his godchildren. Later they talked about other things, and as soon as they had finished eating, the old man walked a little through a covered gallery where the children had an aviary with many canaries. Some days, Mercedes said to her godfather, 
We leave the window panes open and birds from outside come in here to eat what ours drop. And they know so much, Raphael interrupted, that they throw the hemp seeds we give them to the ground as gifts to foreigners. That reminds me of a fable I read not long ago, Don Mario told them. Do you remember her, Godfather? If you repeat it to us. Iltree, but don't ask me any more apologists, my repertoire has run out. The old man stopped to think for a few moments and then told them the following composition. The Sparrow and the Canary One winter day, beautiful, clear, on the balcony. Of an elegant house, you could see a canary. In a golden cage that incessantly released. Joyful trills. Golden birdseed, dark hemp seeds, fresh. Escarole and crystalline water. He had abundant daily, what else? Did he need to live? A sparrow, jealous of his happiness. Cautiously approached the cage, ate what was. Discarded by the other, and finally said. These words to him, that you live well. There is no doubt, that you are calm, something is. Known and that he is silent, but what are all? Those joys worth when you lack sweet freedom. I do not change my luck for yours, I cross. The space of sapphire and scarlet, in the streams I drink and my food I look for in. Summer in the high spikes. I have my nest hidden between the tiles of a safe and high wall. When you can flee, leave your irons, because a prison has never been pleasant. The little bird remained meditative, weighing all the cons and advantages, and fixed his little eyes on the other, answered without anger and calmly, You, for being free, suffer the rigors of rain and frost in winters, I am a prisoner, while it freezes. I find artificial heat in my dwelling. Here I do not fear lead from the hunter, nor from enemies the fatal fury, I see the sun like you, I see space, her caresses are given to me by my beloved owner. I do not run away from the man who listens to my Song while I shake my wings with pleasure. I want my slavery in a golden cage more than that freedom that you decant me. I do not long to look for wheat with anxiety. Because that wheat too is finally finished, your feast will not be very covetable when you seek the crumbs of mine. And that is, said the godfather to finish, what those sparrows do that come to your aviary to see what your canaries throw out of it, the fable seems to have been written for them. Don Mario was well aware that he was no longer there for that continuous travel. Although he was not ailing, he noticed a certain tiredness and he grew more and more attached to his family, particularly to those lovely children. So he promised them that he would return in the spring, intending to stay there forever leaving his affairs in Madrid in the care of a trusted administrator. The news was heard with immense joy by all. That would be the last time he would be in the place for such a short time. Before leaving, as he did at the other stations, the godfather referred to Mercedes and Raphael the three winter tales that we publish below. Chapter 1 January, Three Kings Day To the Magi Melcher Gasper and Baltasar. Knowing how much you love the children and that you listen to their requests, I am writing to you today, January 5th, so that tomorrow you can bring me, as I have no doubt they will, because I am good and I have no fault, a military suit with the weapons that correspond to it, a horse, a velocipede, a box of soldiers and everything else they deem appropriate leaving it on the balcony of my house next to the boot that I will have on it. Marshal Guerrero This was written by the eldest son of the general of this last name, with clear handwriting and medium spelling, 
while his little sister Sophia waited for him to finish so that he would write for her, since she still did not know how to do it well. Martial took about half an hour to draw those lines, being very satisfied with the way he asked the kings for his gifts. Now you dictate, that I will put exactly what you tell me. When pronouncing these words, he looked at the girl who answered with some shyness, because he understood that his brother's ideas were opposed to his own. Tell them, Sophia murmured, that I don't want dolls, because I already have many and it's better that they give them to the poor little girls who don't have any, nor jewels, but just some random thing, of little value, so that I can see that they want something from me and that they don't consider me bad. They don't give anything to children who aren't good, Mom told me, that SWHY I want any object, however insignificant it may be. How stupid you are! The brother interrupted. What do you care if other girls have toys or not if you don't even know them? Didn't I tell me a few days ago that you really liked a baby with its complete layette and that you would buy it as soon as you had enough money for it? Well, what do you lose asking the kings? No, no, put what I told you and don't try to deceive me, because I don't know how to write fine, but I already read in manuscript. If you don't do what I ask, I won't sign the letter. Martial pleased Sophia, she put her name at the bottom of those lines and the boy put the sheets in different envelopes, sealing them with sealing wax and with the seal that had his father's initials, the one that bore his same name. He was going out to deliver the letters to a servant to post them, when the mother of the children entered. This was a young and beautiful lady, very discreet and who tried to educate her children well. Aware of Marcial's wishes, she took the two envelopes and said sweetly, The male of the Magi is not the same as that of men. The first ones do not usually know him more than their fathers and mothers. The letters are transmitted by an invisible thread that unites the earth with the sky. Only the letters of the angels of this world, who are children, are allowed in it. Among these the there are better and worse, and according to what they are, they receive the gifts of the Magi. They leave prizes for the good ones so that they persevere in goodness, to the mischievous, to the ambitious, to those who have some easy sin to correct, they send them something that will serve as a lesson or they do not give them anything. Okay, said Martial, take the letters as you want, but don't forget, please. God, to make them reach their destination. I'm going to send them right now. And he left taking the sealed envelopes. During the afternoon, some children, relatives or friends, came to play with Martial and Sophia, two or three stayed to dine with them, but by ten o'clock they had all left and the two little brothers went to their bedrooms to go to bed. Before, their mother told them that she had already put one of each shoe on the balconies. Martial went to bed alone, Sophia was still undressed by her mother's maid. The general and his wife had stayed in the drawing room with several friends who would not leave until after twelve. The boy, before entering his room, went to his father's, he took a riding boot, the one that seemed to him the largest of all, and opening the balcony of the cabinet, he put it in the place of one of his patent leather shoes that he judged was too small for the king and queen to see and place next to him the many gifts that he had asked for. Then he returned to his bedroom, lay down and slept restlessly waiting with feverish anxiety for the happy moment when he would see the gifts of the Magi. Meanwhile, Sophia had removed a little shoe from one of her dolls, begging the maid to put it in its place on the balcony of the living room so that the kings would not leave her more than a small object, as she had requested. Then she prayed, went to bed, and fell peacefully asleep listening to a story that the maid told her for the twentieth time and from which she had reached the outcome of only two or three nights. The next morning, January 6, a splendid winter day, cold but clear, with a cloudless sky, Martial and Sophia bundled up, happy, smiling, ran to open the balconies. 
the boy wanted to see what had been given to him first. Just as he had left it was his father's riding boot, that big boot, the biggest in the house. Nothing surrounded her, nothing contained, she was there motionless, upright, it seemed to Marcial that she was even angry and arrogant. Tears came to the child Sayez and he raised his eyes to heaven as if directing a reprimanding look at the holy kings. Then they went to the living room, and on one of its balconies, on the Dalsteiny shoe, they saw a magnificent baby with its precious basket and next to it other beautiful toys to put in a dollshouse that Sophia had wanted for a long time. The girl also looked at the sky with a happy, smiling expression, and placing the fingers of her right hand over her mouth, she sent a kiss to Melcher, another to Gasper, and another to Baltasar as a sign of gratitude. Thus, with some caress, it was how she used to say thank you when they gave her any gift. Then he took out a box where he kept the money saved to buy the baby and he secretly said to his mother, Mom, bring something for my poor little brother. General Guerrero took advantage of that lesson that Marcial received to scold the boy. You have been ambitious, he began, and for wanting everything you have had nothing. When you are a man and you pretend to be the first, growing at the expense of others, remember this event and think that if you had left your little shoe on the balcony you would have had your toys, you have put my boot on and, as your mother told you, the Magi only send their gifts to children. Be good, be humble, and don't want everything for yourself. Martial promised to make amends and he fulfilled it. The following year he put one of his little shoes on the balcony and received three magnificent gifts of the kings. Chapter 2 February, The Children's Dance On the fourth floor of an elegant house on Calle de Alcala, a music teacher married to a dance teacher and two girls aged six and nine, the fruits of that marriage, lived in Madrid a long time ago. At the beginning of their stay at court, Fortune had smiled on them, the husband and wife having not a few lessons, but then several competitors appeared, if not more skillful, then happier than them, and their incomes were reduced so much that they barely had enough to pay for the room, which, even if it was inside, cost them dearly, and to eat little and dress modestly. The two girls carried the sadness of their situation in very different ways. The eldest, Eugenia, was upset with her parents because they did not dress her with luxury or attend to her whims. The second, Paz, who was very modest, resigned herself to everything because she did not know vanity. That year Carnival fell in mid-February and there was no talk in the crown town of anything other than the costume ball that was to be held in one of the main theaters as a gift to children. Since the products were for charity and they wanted to get the most out of it, the tickets cost expensive. Eugenia longed to go to the party and did not stop pestering her parents to take her. But daughter, her mother told her, how do you want your wish to come true if I don't thave what to make your suit with? Yes, the girl replied, you have some pink silk rods, you have lace and a good mantilla. With your skill, well, you don't lack for anything, you make me a skirt and a bra and you dress me up as a Maya. But from that fabric that they gave me to make a dress for your little sister, it doesn't come out more than a suit and you are two girls. There are not two mantillas either. Let peace not come, im the oldest. That night, the day before the party, the teacher brought a ticket for the children's dance that one of his few disciples had given him. Eugenia's joy had no limits. She had her mother start sewing at once, and although the dress did not fit very well, as there was little material, the proud girl thought that she was pretty enough to make up for whatever was lacking in her attire. A friend of her mother so was bringing a child dressed as a harlequin was sought out to accompany her to the theater, and an hour before the start of the dance Eugenia left his house. Paz had helped to fix her sister by giving the hairpins, the pins, and all the things they had asked for. 
he had found her very beautiful and the idea that she too had had fun at the party flashed through his mind, but since they couldn't take her, he had to make do. Her mother told her that, because she was so good, she would go with her for a walk to see the masks and the decorated cars, but because of the fuss she had been having sewing so much and so quickly, she had a severe headache and had to lie down on the bed. Her good husband did not want to leave her alone and that is why he did not offer to go out with the girl. Paz looked out on the balcony that overlooked the patio. On the second floor, many children could be seen passing from one side to the other through the windows, all elegantly dressed in masks with costumes that she did not know. One of the boys stopped for a while to look at her, then spoke to a gentleman, who looked at her too, and then the boy quickly disappeared. A moment later there was a knock on the street door and the dance teacher came out to open it. A funny boy dressed as an Andalusian appeared before him and asked permission to come in and talk to him for a moment. The teacher ushered him into the little room where Paz was leaning out of the balcony. The girl closed the windows and sat next to her father who had already offered the boy a chair. You will say that I am daring, he began with charming grace, but my parents, who are the owners of this house, have given me permission to come ask you for a favor. Several of my friends and I plan to go to the party this afternoon dressed in costumes from different provinces and dance some things there, Hoda, Sevilanas, Munera and others. I had a cousin of mine as a companion, but she is very capricious and at the last minute she wanted to go to the theater to see a magic comedy. I can't go alone. It's natural, interrupted the teacher to say something. If you, the Andalusian dress continued, would like to leave your girl to come with us. Me with the greatest pleasure, but he doesn't thave a suit, the professor stammered. My partner sis at home, my mother directed it and I was thinking of giving it to her. Do you know how to dance Sevillanas? He then asked the girl. A little, answered Paz. Let's see, rehearse with me. I will sing them so that we have music. The teacher's daughter, whom he had taught, danced admirably and with great grace. The Sevillanas came out very well. The boy, full of enthusiasm, went to give his parents the good news and a moment later the boy's mother came up with a maiden who carried in her hands a delicious suit that seemed to have been made for paws. They put it on and adorned her with magnificent jewels. She was lovely, her father never tired of admiring her and her mother was relieved of her ailment when she thought of how much fun her daughter was going to have. In the ballroom, adorned with plants and splendidly lit, the entrance of that crowd of children dressed in regional costumes caused a great sensation. It was the main thing at the party because those beautiful couples full of attractions danced or sang very well. Paz and her partner attracted all eyes and they were designated to win the prize that was to be awarded to those who distinguished themselves most. Eugenia was sad because not only had she not attracted attention because she was pretty and elegant, but she had also noticed that some people were laughing at her suit and she heard one say, that girl goes where I want to and I can't. She had not seen the couples dressed in the finery of the different provinces, but when they were going to leave the room they had to make way for them between two lines of people and she was among the first. As the Andalusians passed, a gentleman shouted. Long live Grace! And the children, happy, smiled and waved. That girl, Eugenia murmured, looks like Paz, yes, very, very much. She is prettier, has better color, and is admirably dressed. If it were her. But it's impossible. I am such a fool. My little sister has stayed at home even more boring than me, and I haven't thad much fun. Great was his astonishment when, upon returning to his home, he found Paz in the Andalusian dress that his companion's mother had given her as well as the prize that was unanimously awarded to the charming couple. 
and from that day everything was fortunate in the house. Because the owners of it became protectors of the two teachers and the music and dance lessons rained down and with them well-being and happiness returned. Eugenia never aspired to be the first in anything, joining her younger sister in all her projects and being good and generous to her. Chapter 3 March Angel It was truly an impressive spectacle that the inhabitants of Villa Clara were going to witness in the Plaza Mayor. The elevation of the Hector Balloon had been announced for the last of the show made up of gymnastic exercises, ribbon races, and velocipedes. Tribunes had been placed at the entrances to close off the great square that was teeming with people on all sides. The balconies were completely occupied and the same was true for the windows in the attics and even on the roofs. The preparations to inflate the balloon lasted a long time, but meanwhile the municipal band played several pieces, the best of their repertoire, to distract the public. Finally, and this was the truly sensational thing, the aeronaut appeared, followed by his wife and his son, a young boy. They were all dressed alike, blue. He was tall, dark, with black hair and eyes. She and the little boy were blonde and of ideal beauty. The first to enter the gondola was the young woman to whom the child was delivered, and there were then not a few voices of protest among the public. Finally he went up, the moorings were released and the balloon rose majestically while the couple did gymnastic exercises and the sun blew kisses to the public bringing his little hands to his lips. The crowd followed with anxious eyes the balloon that receded first slowly, then faster, until it was gone. And shortly after this happened, there was one of those atmospheric changes so frequent in March, since it was the 18th of this month when that party had been celebrated. What was at first a gentle breeze, then lively air, became a furious hurricane and there was no person who did not tremble, luckily for that unfortunate family that risked its existence for a handful of gold. There was no mother who did not pray for that little angel who was surely going to perish, asking God to perform a miracle and save his life. And meanwhile the poor aeronaut struggled with the element that was destroying the balloon and tried to cheer up his wife and comfort his crying and cold son. His desire was to descend anywhere he went, but he could not, and thus several hours passed without the wind ceasing, that family exposed to perish without finding help that no one could give them. Finally, at dawn, the husband managed to go down a rope to reach the roof of a palace, solidly tied the rope to the iron railing, climbed up it and wanted his wife to come down. Save the child first, she told him, it's all our love, and then come for me. That child, in fact, was their charm and their joy and since they would not have been separated from him for anything in the world, they had taken him when the dangerous ascent was verified, believing that, like other times, it would be carried out with all happiness. He caught the little one in one arm and, though with great difficulty, managed to leave his son on the terrace. Then he went back up, but as he put his foot in the gondola, a gust of wind even stronger than the others broke the rope and the balloon rose with great speed. Thanks to the fact that he was a skilled gymnast, the man was able to save himself from that risk by reuniting with his wife. The child, crying with fear and cold, sat down among the plants that adorned the roof, and after a while he fell asleep in a heavy, feverish sleep. The owner of that palace was a very charitable and very good widow, who had an immense fortune, being the relief of the local poor. Her only regret was that she had never had children. She lived alone with her servants without wanting to leave that town where she had lived since her childhood. A town without a railway, difficult to communicate with other places because it only has a bad road, without newspapers, with little, but a well-matched neighborhood, run for many years by the same priest, the same doctor, and the same mayor. A town without ambition or aspirations, the best, the simplest that there is in Spain. 
The lady, who was an early riser, had just gotten up and was looking out of one of the windows at the cloudy sky. The wind hadn't stopped yet. Beside him was Ramona, one of his maids. Windy March and rainy April make May flowery and beautiful, said the lady. That does not mean that the hurricane has damaged my best plants and many will not be able to show off their finery in two months. Come with me to the roof to see what damage we have to lament. The lady and the maiden approached all the pots, looking at them one by one, seeing with satisfaction that the wind had not caused as much damage as they supposed. Suddenly the lady gave a cry rushed into some bushes and took the aeronaut's son in her arms. Look, look, Ramona, he exclaimed, this is a little angel sent to me by the glorious Saint Joseph, whose feast we celebrate today. If I were an abandoned child, I wouldn't be on the terrace, which can only be reached by the stairs inside the palace, it'd be downstairs, in the street, at most in the garden. Yes, he is an angel and so that he would not go down to earth naked, his companions have dressed him with a little piece of heaven. How much we will love him! Because you will love him too, right? Oh! Yes, with all my soul, replied the maiden. I will love him, I will respect him, I will revere him. Precisely tonight, continued the widow, I was thinking about the need for an heir a creature that would carve out the happiness of the last third of my existence. And you see, St. Joseph has sent me this child who will be my son, all my love. The poor thing is frozen, we are going to put him in my own bed until we buy him. A cot. The news of the mysterious discovery spread quickly through the town and there was no person who did not go to see what they called the miracle child. He suffered a very serious illness and the lady of the palace took care of him with solicitude and care. When he was well and was able to speak, they saw that he was doing so in a language unknown to everyone. The language of angels, said the lady. Little by little the boy was learning Spanish and when Ramona asked him one day for her parents, she looked up at the blue firmament and her eyes filled with tears. Don't make him feel nostalgic for heaven, said the lady severely, nobody will ask where it came from, this is a secret that you cannot and should not reveal. The child, whom they called Angel, grew in beauty and perfection. With a sweet and peaceful character, of superior intelligence, he was the charm of his teachers, his classmates, his adoptive mother, and everyone who knew him. They did find him somewhat melancholic, and when the wind stirred the treetops and the clouds piled up in the sky, he sighed sweetly and a crazy hope took hold of him, searching the celestial space for a balloon that never came, a much-loved and ardently desired balloon, which had been lost forever, in whose gondola was a brave and generous man whom he called father and a woman who kissed him with the love of a true mother, with a tenderness that he had never found again. And it is that in that town the respect and veneration for the angel prevented the sweet expansions of love for the child. The course of the four seasons, that is, the calendar year, has ended, dear children. It begins smiling with spring and ends melancholic with the snows of winter. The flower is followed by the fruit, the heat by the cold, and nature resumes its majestic course year after year, century after century. This is life, the child is an asshole, to the warmth of the parents it opens its petals, it falls in love in its youth with its beauty and with the aroma of its joy, then it languishes and finally it is extinguished in the nothing from where the breath of the divinity took it. But just as the flower is only sensitive matter, man has a soul, which in life allows him to think and do good or bad, being welcomed by God in the first case, to reward his good works or devoured by Saturn who, as image of time, annihilates everything that has no other purpose than temporary life on earth. Sometimes a good soul serves to attract another bad one to the path of good, just as, unfortunately, 
it often happens that the rotten apple corrupts its companion, as the fable tells us, and in that case one must admire more and more. The goodness of the eternal, which allows the redemption of the bad through the grace achieved by the good. In the following event, with which this book consecrated to the season's ends, you will find demonstrated what I have just said. Marcelo was bad, Miguel was good, and God allowed him to be the angel of salvation for his uncle and teacher.